excellent and Right, uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, it's April, gosh, already, um, and uh, our guest is uh, Mary McIntyre. Uh, I should put F R A S at the end of that, and uh, uh, she's been wonderful. She agreed about a year ago to come and talk to us, and uh, a month or so ago we agreed that uh constellations from mythology to modern day one of her uh, talks would be best for us um because uh yeah. if you actually go on to mary's site you'll find that uh, she does a, a number of talks um uh, across the subject so we may well have mary back but uh, uh more to come on that one so let's move on. So it's the usual uh, crowd that are looking after you. We've got Abby, Chris, Jonathan, Mike and myself and our current memberships are is 45 paid up members of a society. And you can always get in touch with us, whether it's by Facebook, whether it's by email, looking at the website, um, even on our Twitter account, hit us with a message on Messenger. And uh, we're usually quite good. Get back to people within the day, um, if not faster, depending on how boring work is. But I shouldn't be, uh, have all these feeds open at work. But yes, we're uh, nice and healthy and uh, we run our sessions last uh, Wednesday of each month uh, from September to June. So uh, we've got uh, a few uh, more left. We've got a session uh, in May and one in June. And then we've got our holiday over July and August before we restart <laughs> in September. Um, so uh, what, what's really been happening um, or what, what, what's going to be happening um, over the, the uh, coming month or so um, over the coming summer? So what have we got in the diaries? Because the diaries to date have been really quite empty because of COVID. Well, uh, first bit of good news is the Herschel Museum of Astronomy is opening up to bubbles on the 17th of May. Um, that's, uh, they've had grants to keep them in business. Uh, up up until now and they've got a grant that will actually keep them supported through 2021 um, but opening the doors is what they want to do what they need to do let's get people back into the museum seeing the all the history of the Herschel family uh, in their base in Bath um, and stroll into the garden where Uranus was discovered so that's really nice that they're opening up again um, uh, we haven't actually done as a, uh, a, a club any uh, visits to schools for over a year now. The last one was in March 2020. We've got a booking um, to go into a primary school uh, on the 18th of May. Um, and that's all going to be based in uh, playgrounds with telescopes and things like that or the, the uh, backup is going to be in the school hall. Um, so I'm going to be in PPE at one end and the kids are going to be at the other. Um, but it'd be great to get back into schools and sort of slowly start the process of our outreach activities again. Um, so that's, that's nice to have that one in the diary. Um, there's an extra talk that's been organized uh, in conjunction with the Wells and Mendip astronomers on William Herschel. And so there's an extra diary date on the 19th of June. Wells and Mendip are doing the organization, but we're sort of helping them out. Um, so um, I'm trying to remember uh, Dr. Wolfgang uh, Steineck uh, is talking about Herschel and his dis uh, deep uh, space discoveries. Um, so that'll be a, a fun talk to go along to. Um, it's a free talk, but you do need to register via Billito. Um, if you require any details, actually, I haven't got them on the website, but they are available on Facebook. So I'll put them on, make sure they're on the um, website as well. So if you want to come along to that, but the details will also be in our email roundup. If so, if you're a member, you'll get to see it there. Uh, continuing the outreach, the Herschel Museum is opening its doors uh, for solar observing. So on the solstice, uh, we're going to be helping out running the telescopes in the back garden. Um, hopefully, if it's clear, uh, we'll be able to see the sun and some sunspots. Uh, we'll uh, have white light and uh, we'll have uh, the H alpha scopes and uh, hopefully teach people a little bit about the sun. We'll run it in the same way we did last summer, which is um, the visitors get an hour in the museum and that's to go around, uh, have a look around, but also then come and look through the telescopes and chat and find out a bit about the sun. And we do it in uh, bubbles and each of the bubbles gets an hour. So it's not a, a big money earner, but it does get people into the museum. It does get them looking through telescopes. Um, so that'll be fun. And. 
Uh, we've got our members' night, so thank you very much. And we've got seven volunteers so far to do a talk on members' night. Um, so we'll sort out a few more details, but that's great. Thank you for all the people that said that they uh, would like to uh, uh, say a few words and sort of introduce themselves or talk about their projects or um, the stuff that interests them. So that should be a good night, um, just effectively to extend our chat, but also for you to tell um, us a little bit uh, uh, more about your hobby and why you enjoy it so much. And uh, the one thing we normally have all the way through the summer um, in uh, pre-COVID times is lots of fairs and things to go to. We actually got bookings at two. Um, which come in. So there's two fairs that we're going to be running locally, uh, one in Wello, which is quite good because um, that's where we do uh, or have been doing a lot of our observing um, to date. And we've also got Bath Hampton have also booked us um, to go in. And that's again, just setting up telescopes, generally talking to people. Uh, we'll still be um, uh, with the COVID restrictions in there. So um, it'll be slightly downsized compared to what we normally do. But again, it's great to start the outreach again and be active and start talking to people. Uh, so it's been a busy month for uh, uh, doing stuff. Uh, so uh, hopefully you, you all got to see the first powered flight on another planet. And watch it turn. Here it goes. There. So 40 seconds, 39 seconds of history there. Straight up, straight down. Yeah. So that was great watching that. And then last week we had uh, the capsule Endeavour, uh, the Crew Dragon, returning to the International Space Station on uh, Mission Crew 2. Now speeded this up 16 times. It's got a really nice Apollo feel uh, by speeding it up like this, but it successfully docked. Now, not only was the rocket that took it there, the first stage, a reused rocket, this was also Endeavour actually flew up uh, with um, uh, the very first Demo 2 uh, human flight uh, by SpaceX to the International Space Station as well. Um, so uh, the idea of reuse is sort of uh, uh, fully embedded now. Um, so that's all good stuff. Now, more practically, from uh, sort of a perspective of Bath and monitoring what's going on in the night sky, I also do a bit of meteor watching. I, I, I look for me, uh, radar uh, reflections. And here was the uh, Lyrid meteor shower. Um, now, the interesting thing about the Lyrids this year is I told everyone to go out on the 21st and 22nd here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but it was here. The actual peak occurred two days later this year. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so absolutely nothing happened on the nights I told people to go out on, but that's typically the 21st, 22nd is typically the night of the Lyrids, but it actually came in. You can see it came in a really big way uh, on the 24th. Um, so if you were up in the early hours of the 24th, you should have seen something quite spectacular. I, of course, wasn't because I thought it was on the 21st, 22nd. Um, but that's one of the be benefits of having, I, I suppose, in hindsight, um, a, a camera uh, or one of these radar reflectors that is just doing the counts for you. You can actually see what's going on and it's not so subjective. And um, this one will actually see through clouds. So it could well have been cloudy. Um, but yes, the Lyrids was quite good this year. I didn't get to see it uh, other than electronically. Uh, I did manage to get to see the sun. And so the sunspots are coming back. So there's um, some small groups, but they're good uh, for white light and telescope uh, viewing. So uh, this is from my garden. And so uh, we've got a, a few groups here. This was, I think, just at the weekend. Um, this group went past the center of the sun. So um, when it's a really high activity, it looks like the face of a teenager. At the moment, we just got one or two little pimples uh, on the chin, as it were. But uh, you can see the detail um, I'm not sure how the resolution is coming through, but uh, on some of these sunspots. And uh, if you've got an H alpha, there's been uh, quite a bit of activity picking up um, when you're looking around on the limb of the sun as well. 
So um, the sun is waking up. It definitely is after its quiet spell. So it's definitely one to keep watching. Uh, I went out uh, on, when was it, uh, Tuesday? Um, to oh, Monday, sorry, uh, to see uh, that the super moon or the perigee syzygy uh, moon. Um, and I thought uh, the museum had asked for full moon pictures uh, because they wanted to do some promos. And I didn't actually have any. Uh, so I thought I'd go and do Beckford Tower, which is part of Bath Preservation Trust and linked to the Herschel Museum of Astronomy. So I thought I'd go up to the playing fields at Lansdowne and try and capture a photo of Beckford Tower and uh, the moon. And that's the best I got. Um, uh, so we've got the top of Beckford Tower and the moon there. And I was quite chuffed with that shot until I got home and social media started going a bit wild. And these things started coming in uh, from Roger and Sandy, who are in the audience tonight. Um, and they'd been to Glastonbury and they were taking photos of the same moon but without the cloud that i was suffering um and they got some absolutely stunning shots uh so real ones to remember uh, so uh i i was happy with my shot for say for about 15 minutes the time it took me to drive back from lansdowne and then i saw these and said wow you guys i'm just in awe so some amazing shots there so well done on taking those but that's just simply going out uh, and having a look. Um, they did lots of planning to get the position to take these photos um, just right. Um, but uh, it, it's with a very long telephoto lens here, you can get some spectacular effects. You just got to be positioned in the right place. So well done for some amazing photos there, guys. Thank you. So what have we got to see in, in this coming month? Um, uh, so uh, just a simple uh, roundup. So uh, May, we've got 31 days, we've got two bank holidays. So what we're going to do whilst we're going through, well, we've got another meteor shower, the Eti Aquarids, they peak on the 6th. Um, so uh, if you want to get out uh, and have a look there, they're actually going to be around last quarter moon. Uh, so they might be a little bit drowned out, but uh, you never know. You uh, might be able to see a few around that period. Uh, we've got the new moon on the 12th and um, the, the crescent moon, just as it sort of starts building up again, is going to be right by Mercury on the 13th. So that's going to be well worth it. Just after sunset, uh, you should be able to try and find Mercury and the crescent moon. And that should make quite a nice little photo if you can capture it. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, Jupiter is in an interesting position um, because it's effectively uh, just going through the plane of the ecliptic. Um, and what that means is its moons um, actually uh, are uh, eclipsing each other. So you can be looking at the four Galilean moons around uh, Jupiter. And this is in the early hours. You'll have to do this in the early hours of the morning, but you'll actually see them disappear. One of the moons will disappear as it goes into the shadow. And one of those occurs uh, on the 14th where Io, um, close into Jupiter, will be seen to disappear. And that's because the shadow of Ganymede has just gone in front of it. But there's a few of those this month, so it's worth capturing those. I think there's um, about four. So you have to be an early riser to go for those, but well worth it. Um, I mentioned Mercury. Mercury is in the evening sky and it'll be at its best or so it, it's its highest and or most distance from the sun on the 17th. So you want to catch Mercury in the evening sky uh, about half an hour after sunset, then uh, your best chance uh, is around the middle of May. Uh, we've got uh, an old family favourite, which is looking at the uh, shadows, uh, patches on the moon and the shapes they create. So if you haven't seen the lunar X or the lunar uh, uh, V on the moon, then the 18th is a, a reasonable chance to try and see it. And we've just had one of those super moons, the perigee syzygy moon, um, but we've got another one and it's going to be slightly better on the 26th of May. So. I'm not sure where Sandy and um, Roger are going to go on the 26th, but um, there's a potential for uh, redoing the shot um, uh, on uh, Glastonbury, getting that slight bit higher. I don't know what you want to do there, Roger. Um, it might be interesting because the sun will be in a slightly different position. Um, and so it'll all be ever so slightly different. The lighting conditions will be different. So you might that might be quite a nice one to contrast there. 
and uh, going towards the end of the month, we've got Mercury and Venus together in the evening sky. So these are all um, quite nice ones to do. They'll be quite close together. Um, it'll be past Mercury's best time, but it'll be easy to find because there's really bright uh, Venus next to it. Uh, another one of those eclipses occurring, and we've got the moon next to Saturn in the morning sky uh, on the 31st. But given last year's uh, wonderful uh, episodes of noctilucent clouds that we saw. Um, at the end of May is typically when uh, we start seeing uh, those cold blue ice clouds either just after sunset, the hour and a half after sunset, or an hour and a half before dawn. Um, the vivid blue, electric blue clouds um, that actually are ice clouds very high up in the atmosphere that are being lit by uh, the uh, inclination of the sun and they give you this really weird blue iridescent cloud which is um, quite uh, remarkable and I think there's some really cool photos and I think again it's um, uh, Sandy and um, Roger but uh, other people have caught it they caught Neowise and Noctilucent clouds in the same shot and so that was uh, the comet and Noctilucent clouds it's sort of uh, quite a wonderful photo uh, I'm not sure why one of those uh, I'm not going to win the photo of the year competition, but uh, that's kind of pretty. Mike was about the zodiac constellations. Yeah, it will come. Yeah, not Obviously talking not at all. No, no. Okay, <laughs> we'll carry on. Right, so um, we're talking uh, next month. Uh, we've got uh, Peter Williamson, FRAS, uh, coming to um, uh, zoom in, and he'll be talking to us about all the different moons of the solar system. Now, uh, if he goes through each one individually, then we're going to be there for hours. So hopefully he's going to just reduce <laughs> his talk to maybe 20 or 30 of the moons of the solar system. Um, but if you want to see the variety, all the different types of things that are orbiting our planets, um, then uh, this is the talk to come to. So hopefully you'll all be able to come uh, to our May talk and uh, meet Pete. Uh, but without much more ado, it's Mary we've all come to uh, talk to and listen to uh, today. Uh, Alanka Shalas, um, she's loved astronomy from a, a really young age and I think she got her first telescope uh, when she was 11 and um, she's never really looked back since, uh, been constantly looking up in the sky. Um, I think in her bio she mentions getting a ladybird book, book of constellations and perhaps tonight's talk is based on that very ladybird book of constellations you never know but there's lots more to it she'll be going through um uh, from the mythology all the way through to modern day and um, so adding a bit of science in there now uh, she's not lancashire anymore she's based in oxfordshire with her husband um, they've moved out to darker skies and that means they can enjoy their uh, shared hobby of astronomy and all the activities they've got around it um, so we've got photography, she writes about uh, astronomy, she does sketches, she does outreach um, uh, to young and old, um, so very busy writing for magazines such as Sky at Night and All About Space. And she's often asked, especially uh, for moments like um, uh, our popular supermoons that come along, uh, to talk on uh, local radio as well. But she's got some permanent spots. She um, uh, is on an Astro uh, FM radio. She um, is part of the Comet Watch team there. And she's a regular panelist on Reach Out and Touch Base, which is a radio station, uh, astroradio.earth, which is run by Peter Williamson. And it's sort of 24 hours, uh, good music, and interspersed with programs about astronomy. So if you're not getting enough of an astronomy hit at work, uh, get your uh, computer dialed into uh, Astro Radio um, and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Now, uh, the thing about Mary is you've got to have a quick look at her work before um, uh, she starts talking. So I talked about herself and her husband um, and uh, they've been doing some monitoring. These are meteors, so they run meteor ca uh, cameras uh, from their home. So that's one of the benefits of being out in Oxfordshire. So all these are the meteors you might catch in a night. Um, but it's not just the science they're doing. She's also, well, it is the science, uh, which is the science of optics, atmospheric optics. So Mary's really into and enjoys taking photos of all those weird things you see in the sky 
Uh, I, I saw a sun dog the other day and thought you marry, um, but uh, we've got 22 degree circles that you get to see around the sun and the moon and loads of other different features that perhaps if you're walking around staring at your shoes or your phone, you'll never see, but they're there and they're really quite amazing. And uh, she's still keen with the camera. And so uh, her full moon shots from earlier over this year as the moon's rising. And we've got serious pictures of Sirius taken here with a defocused telescope. Uh, as it's low in the atmosphere, you get to see all the color change. Uh, so the, the shots on the right hand side are 16 shots of the same star, all taken as a video and then uh, the separate frames picked out and arranged. But that's all the light from one star. And that just shows you how it shimmers. And all the, when you see a star twinkling, this is the color of the twinkling with the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. But it's not just cameras and things. She picks up all her pens, her chalks, and she um, uh, actually records what she sees, what she takes photos of um, a, a, with her own sort of an initial artistic style. Um, and so here we've got uh, a beautiful image of a lunar crater. Um, so, yeah, a very prolific um, uh, artist for uh, astronomy. And here's one of her uh, sort of latest creations. This is a star trail, but it's a very special star trail. She's taken 24 hours. It's taken uh, lots of different days, lots of different nights and gluing them all together. But there's 24 hours of rotation of the Earth that she's captured over a period of about 15 months here. So there's a lot of pain, I'm sure in capturing all of this. But uh, this is the kind of thing that um, uh, Mary is able to concentrate on and actually bring to her audience. So uh, without any more ado now, Mary, I'd like to hand back over to you. And uh, if you would like to take us through your wonderful talk on constellations mythology uh, to modern day, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I will just share my screen. Oh, it's quite the intro. I don't feel like you need to say anything now. <laughs> um, so thank you for inviting me. I am gutted I couldn't see you in person on this occasion, but hopefully there'll be other chances. And I'm really glad that you chose this talk because this is the talk that generally gets chosen by a non-astronomy crowd because I do a lot of stuff to U3A and Women's Institute. And when it isn't women in astronomy that I get asked to talk about, it's this one. But I did two versions of this talk when I wrote it. And one of them is for an astronomy audience, but you guys are only the second astronomy society society that have actually asked me to do it so I'm really pleased and it goes through some of the mythology of constellations and I think a lot of us are sort of familiar with some of the Greek stuff not my favorites to be honest I find them a bit grisly and the characters are not very nice but I'm interested in some of the other mythology from around the world because every different culture in the world has their own versions of it but then bringing that through into the modern day and what those constellations mean now and what kind of things we're seeing in them and as well as the constellations is a bit of the mythology about some of the the other stuff that we see in the sky because we've got to remember when people were first looking at the sky they did not have the scientific knowledge that we have now so they told stories about it they they drew pictures of it and I'm going to talk about that as we go through. Now, you mentioned that Ladybird book. And the reason this book is so special to me is because I, I had a passing interest in astronomy when I was a child because my mum loved the moon because she remembers seeing the moon landings when she herself was a child. And in the kind of early 80s, when I was in junior school, our school library, the classroom library, had this Ladybird book in it. And I loved it. It brought the stars to life. I mean, it's got star maps in it, so you could kind of learn the things. But it was a combination of the illustrations, the constellations, and then the stories. And these are much briefer versions of the stories and less grisly than the ones you might find on Wikipedia. But I found this book on eBay about four years ago and genuinely when it arrived, I just read it and cried because I went into school early every day that school year so I could read this book. So this book is really important to me. And so I'm really glad that I'm getting to kind of talk about some of the, the legends of the stars tonight. But first of all, I want to talk about how long ago 
people have actually been studying the night sky and basically early humans as we no humans to be evolved around about 200,000 years ago and we know that they did a lot of cave painting and stuff like that and the oldest known cave painting that we know is a recording or we're fairly sure is a recording of the night sky goes all the way back to 17,300 years ago and last year I think it was I heard a rumor that they may have unearthed one that was even older but I haven't seen any confirmation of that yet so this was in the south of France in a place called Lascaux and it's basically paintings that are a series of bulls but when you actually overlay a star map onto this you realize they've obviously corrected because the sky changes in this sort of time frame but they actually realize that these features that they painted on the wall perfectly line up with star maps that we no. And so they actually did the research here and they, they've scaled it a particular way. And obviously the cave paintings are not the constellations that we know them today, but the patterns fit and the dots on there fit which I think is just amazing. When I first read this, I was really, really moved. And, and it's just that kind of thing again of, it's part of the human nature to want to study the sky, which is why I'm so concerned about light pollution and the impact that it's actually having and how many people have never even seen the Milky Way, which I think is really, really sad. Petroglyphs are another record that we have. And these tend to be rock carvings that are located ju they're just dotted around the world I remember seeing a talk by Gary Files who runs Kild founded Kild Kilder Observatory and he went off in pursuit of the best night sky he could find in the world and basically him a friend and a camera guy just got in a camper van and went to the Atacama Desert I think they literally drove there it was just insane and I saw him do a talk on this and he was talking about when they were in the desert just like wandering around and finding these petroglyphs just sitting there out in the open and that feeling that somebody all this time ago has actually carved something that was important to them on that rock and it is still there now and I think he told the crowd that he was really it was unexpected how moved he actually felt when he saw these in person now one from I mean they date back to around about 10,000 years ago we think and there's one here in Arizona which is from about 5,000 years ago and again this one matches up with a star map we've got that although this is a cross this is basically Orion you've got Canis Major over here which I just love with the little legs it's just so cool um but yeah there's the Pleiades and Auriga the Milky Way is even snaking through here and you know I mean these guys have spent a lot of time doing the research here I know it's a bit hard to tell from this one slide just how this stuff matches up but again it's just evidence that the night sky was important to our ancient ancestors and this is another petroglyph from um, White Tanks Regional Park and this is depicting the supernova um, that happened in 1006 in Scorpius so it just shows you that anything important whether it be a supernova a new star I mean how amazed must these guys have been they would have been pretty well acquainted with the night sky we are still amazed now when a new star appears and we know the physics of it so I can't imagine what it must have been like for these guys to have something that's like one of the brightest supernovas in history recorded on something like this so I think it's really important to remember how much the night sky means to our ancestors Another thing that we have as evidence for studying the night sky is uh, these calendars. And these aren't calendars in the sense that you hang it on the wall with a pretty picture on. These were actual lumps of wood or rock that were placed in a certain orientation that meant that the sun or the moon lined up on a particular day of the year. Because although the moon does change, the stars predominantly follow the same path year after year and we know that these calendars exist and they certainly exist for the sun as well and in Mayan culture you quite often get these little notches on a hillside that mark once a month the position of the sun during the year so we know that the oldest ones 
um, around about 10,000 BC. So this is a really long time ago. And there are kind of remains of them and that they exist in various forms throughout the entire world. This is something that was done world over. And this is one particular site where they've done a lot of analysis and figured out what it aligns to. And another thing as well from very long time ago is stone circles. Now these are really hard to date, um, but we think the earliest go back to around about 7,000 BC. Now these are located all over the world, but the British Isles seems to have a huge density of them. And there are about a thousand examples of them within the British Isles. The interesting thing about stone circles is we don't really know what they're used for. A lot of people have theories on it, but we know that they're attuned to the solstices. So the stones within them, whether they be made of stones or wood, you get wood circles as well. And they are lining up with the sun at the solstices or sometimes at the equinox. But other than that, we don't really know what they were used for. Um, obviously the most famous stone circle is probably Stonehenge. This dates around 3100 BC, so it's not the oldest by any means. And it is just a huge source of mystery. And uh, how did those stones get from Wales to, to where it is? You know, it's a long way to go with these huge stones. And I know people have done recreations of lugging these stones around. But we just don't know what these are used for. And I can absolutely guarantee you that the majority of the people that rock up to Stonehenge on a solstice have absolutely no idea why they're actually there. And oftentimes they actually end up damaging this very, very precious monument. So we know that these stone circles are everywhere. And there's actually one called the Rollwright Stones not far from me as well. And there is something, I've never walked around Stonehenge, I've driven past it, but even these little stumpy ones on a smaller scale at Rollwright, you're walking around it and you really do get moved, even though you don't know why you're moved because you don't know what it's actually for. But these things exist all over the British Isles. Another thing that is evidence that people were looking at the night sky is this thing called the Nebra Sky Disc. And this dates back to something around 1600 BC or thereabouts. And this was actually hidden in a cave and some cave robbers broke into the cave and nicked all the stuff, basically. And this was stolen in 1999. And eventually it came to light that they had it and it was said to be possibly one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century and that is because it this is the oldest portable instrument that we've ever found and then this is portable like Stonehenge you can't take with you if you're um, wandering off somewhere you, you can't carry Stonehenge with you to see what date you should sow your crops or whatever so this was a, an instrument that they think was designed for measuring the yearly position of the sun there are all these notches around the outside that correspond to certain things and we think that this little cluster here is the Pleiades one thing that would have been important to people, obviously they would have had to grow food because in 1600 BC, we didn't have um, Tesco online food delivery. So actually knowing the position of the stars doesn't really have any effect on how you grow things. But knowing the position of the stars will tell you when the seasons are. So you'll know that when a particular constellation appears, it may be a showery period for your country and therefore a good time to sow crops. And the, the, the full moons were named by the Native American Indians, named after the things that were prevalent in that area during each full moon and, you know, stuff like that. And there are lots of legends as well about Sirius appearing and causing floods in Egypt. Obviously, these guys didn't know that the stars are so far away that they couldn't possibly have any effect on our rainfall but this these are you know food and crop sowing is possibly one of the main reasons why people wanted to measure this stuff but either way this is a very very important discovery because it shows that these portable things did actually exist all that time ago and another one that's always fascinated me and has actually been in the news again recently is the Antithakira mechanism. This was dating back to Greece around about 150 BC. 
And this is like a gnarly piece of stone right now, but they've done so much work on trying to figure out what this was. And this was another portable instrument that had, it was kind of like an astronomical clock, if you will. And this was um, based on scans and x-rays of it. They built this kind of transparent perspex model of it. And I think the front of this has always been a bit of a mystery as to exactly how it was built and whatever. This was an extraordinarily complicated piece of machinery and nothing like it was ever seen again until the kind of watchmakers of the 18th century. So whoever built this had some skill that was way ahead of their time. Now this hit the news recently because um, a group at University College London have been using computer modeling to try and put this together because it's one thing trying to print stuff in put it in perspex blocks and see how it works but actually being able to figure out you can see the complexity here there is so much stuff going on and it looks like there are things in orbit around other things and you know I don't know if we'll ever get to the bottom fully of what all this does and I think the model that they built out of perspex didn't work terribly well in terms of accuracy but give these guys a break this was incredibly complex engineering that went into this thing so I'm pretty sure that the Antithikira mechanism is going to keep scientists busy for a very long time. But again, it's evidence of another kind of portable astronomical type of equipment. Now, in terms of the constellations, the, the constellations were beginning to be named quite a long time ago. And back in Mesopotamia, there was about 3500 BC period. There were about 60 constellations named by those guys. And then Egypt, um, named about 36 a few thousand years later. And then India also had 27 constellations named. Now remember, there are small numbers here because people could only see their area. Global travel wasn't really a thing around this time for people to uh, study other parts. Now, Chinese are really interesting. They started off with 28, but by 400 AD, they had 284 constellations in the sky. And the reason for that is a lot of them are way smaller and they tend to have a, a slightly different angle compared to other constellations. They're not so much mythologies as objects that were, for example, a market stall or a, a taxpayer's desk or stuff like that, like inanimate objects that were obviously still important to their culture. So the Chinese really liked their constellations and have a lot of them. And you'll quite often get three, sometimes four Chinese constellations overlapping with one Greek one. Now, it wasn't until around about the fourth century BC that the Greek Roman constellations were named. And these are the ones that we still use today. And originally 48 were named, but we now have 88 officially recognized. And that's because more were added once people were able to go to the Southern Hemisphere, because of course we can't see all of the, the Southern sky from this location. Now, when we look up at the night sky on a clear night, if you have no horizon like this, this is using Stellarium. If you don't know your constellations very well, it can be really, really difficult to find them. And this is why I like Stellarium a lot, because not only can you change the direction that you're looking and kind of zoom around the sky, you can kind of zoom in and out, but you can press a button that says add constellation lines. And this is really good because anything other than Orion, beginners very often struggle to, to get. They quite often know the plough, but trying to point out other constellations to people can be a real battle. But the other thing that Stellarium has that I love is you can add the artwork as well. Now, I must say that every single person that has been commissioned to do a piece of art for a constellation story comes up with different orientation, different size, different shape. So none of these artworks are you know, set in stone. The things that Orion is carrying can vary from a club to a shield to an animal skin. Everybody has their own interpretation of it. And when you start looking at the Greek stories, it's hard to even find the same version twice. Every book I have on Greek mythology or constellation mythologies tells a story slightly differently. So you can draw your own, you can make your own shapes and put your own artwork on it if you want to. Now the night sky is rotating and if you notice up here we have Polaris and the sky is kind of rotating about the pole. Now for us in the northern hemisphere we're quite fortunate that in our lifetime Polaris is almost at the centre 
uh, 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 almost directly above the North um, North Pole. For us, it's about 51, 52 degrees north. So if you're standing looking north in your garden, it will be about 52 degrees up from the horizon. Within our lifetime, it is fixed. It isn't fixed, as I'm going to show you in a second, but it almost is fixed and it will always be in the north in our timeline. That star wasn't always the North Star during kind of 20, I think his procession is about 22,000 years or thereabouts, and the Earth is wobbling on its axis. Therefore, the star directly above the poles changes over time. But we're just fortunate that we have Polaris there right now. But all of those stars rotate around that, and that is um, actually important for some of the mythological stories that we hear. That movement of the stars blends in with some of the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight. Now, Simon showed you this. Oh my God, this, this image honestly redefines labor of love. Um, I have been trying to pull this off for over three years. And the other night I, I, I thought I'd miss my gap again. I had a tiny gap missing down here. <laughs> This particular image is made up of 32 hours of star trails, but I've actually got another 30 hours on top of that as well, just in the last 14 months. I've been out seven times imaging from dusk till dawn with my camera in almost exactly the same spot and then blended it all together. But the reason this is important uh, because in 24 hours, that if you have 24 hours of darkness, the stars do form a full circle. They don't look like they do because these were done under different moonlights and where the stars overlap from different imaging runs, they get brighter and dimmer. But I promise this is full circles all the way around. I, I just didn't execute it that well. But you can see Polaris isn't at the, uh, directly above the North Celestial Pole here because it's actually drawn out a circle all of its own. But that is such a minuscule circle that we don't need to worry about it. Now, they would form full circles within 24 hours. Now, what we're capturing there, if we look at a time lapse video, this is a 10 hour, 35 minute one. And you can see Polaris is moving a little bit. The important thing to look at here is that the stars are all rotating. They set in the west, rise in the east. The stars further away from the pole move faster in a given time period. But that whole kind of thing is the the stars drawing out circles but if you point to the south from the UK they form straight lines the further away from the pole the less curved they are once you get past the celestial equator they curve around the opposite pole so maybe that's another project for a future time trying to get the south celestial pole 24 hours but I'm not doing it anytime soon but what we're capturing here is not actually the movement of the stars the stars themselves are not moving every night in a big circle what we're capturing there is actually the rotation of earth and the trick question is always always when we go into schools how long does that take and it is not 24 hours it's just under four minutes less than um, 24 hours and that's important because it means the stars rise four minutes earlier each day and that is what gives rise to the different constellations at different times of year and that is important because these facts come into the mythologies of them so I'm going to go through some of the, the, the kind of more well-known constellations and I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the different mythological stories. I've got some notes here. I don't ever read from notes when I do talks, but some of the names within the Greek mythology stuff just won't stay in my head unless I've got it written down. So if you see me looking down, that's what I'm doing. So first of all, is Ursa Major. Now, the plow is this series of seven stars that is part of a much bigger um, constellation of the Great Bear. And this is a photograph there, and I'll just draw the stars. And you can see on a dark night, it is really difficult to see these constellations, particularly when there's no moon. And as a beginner, a bit of moonlight will help you because a moonlight will bleach out the fainter stars. And obviously, these have been named for being brighter stars because the moon was still a source of light pollution to these ancestors that were naming these things. So actually, constellations are easier to see when you don't have a new moon for a beginner anyway, particularly if you live somewhere dark. So this is Ursa Major. And as I said there, that this little asterism, as we call it, of seven stars is useful because these two stars do be in Mirac in the bowl of the plough, um, always point to the pole star. And naked eye from most locations, the next 
good star that you can see with your naked eye will be Polaris if you follow that line down. So that's a really useful thing. Now, I said that the stars aren't moving before. That's not strictly true. Within our lifetime, it's very unusual to see any proper motion of the stars, but the stars themselves are actually moving relative to each other. So I used to give the Greeks a really hard time for thinking these constellations don't look remotely like the characters that they were naming. But to give them their due, the stars have changed a little bit in that time period. And certainly way back when humans were very early humans, the stars would have been in a different shape to what they are now. So this is that little group of seven stars as we see it now. But 100,000 years ago, it looked like this. And today it looks like that. And in another 100,000 years, it's going to look like this. And that is because all of those stars, they're all nothing to do with each other. They're all different distances away. And I'll come to that in the sciencey bit at the end. But they're all moving relative to each other. So that shape is going to change over long time periods, not something that we will see within our lifetime. Now, I mentioned um, this Ladybird book. Today, even though I've been looking at the sky since I was a young child, whenever I look at Ursa Minor, I see this little cute face here. I think this artwork is so much nicer than this one. Uh, it's just beautiful. But also look, notice how the handle of the plough here is the tail of the bear on this one, but the nose of the bear on this one. It's really difficult to get anything that actually lines up. Now, the Roman mythology, um, within Roman mythology, Jupiter was the king of the gods and Jupiter was lusting after Callisto, who was a really beautiful young woman. Now, Juno was Jupiter's wife and she was very, very jealous and she discovers that this beautiful lady Callisto actually has a son and she is convinced that Jupiter is the father of this son and she just can't bear it any longer she gets really really jealous and she turns the beautiful Callisto into a bear so that she can't tempt her husband anymore I don't know whether there's any truth to this infidelity but this is this is what she thought so she turned Callisto into a bear and whilst in bear form Callisto was wandering around the woods and her son Arcus was walking through the woods as well and he encountered a bear and was about to kill the bear because obviously the bear he thought the bear would kill him otherwise and seeing this um, basically Jupiter basically stopped him from killing the bear, turned Arcos into a bear as well, and then put them both in the sky where they have the little bear and the big bear where they're safe from people hunting them. So Arcos is the little bear and um, Callisto is Ursa Major, the, the great bear who is his mum. So yeah, it's, it's, all of the Greek legends seem to center around people being horrible and infidelity and wars and stuff like that. I much prefer the Aztec mythology for this and the Aztec mythology is a jaguar with a wooden leg and I think that is hilarious and so I did this little drawing to to show that and he's even got an eye patch I don't know whether the real one would have had an eye patch but there we go now in Aztec mythology the god was a guy called Quetzalcoatl and he was a really kind and helpful God. And he taught all of his followers really lovely, virtuous skills. Um, he just looked after them, made them all into really good people. But Quetzalcoatl's brother was a guy called Tezcatlipoca. I'm going to call him Tez because I really struggled to say Tezcatlipoca. But Tez was a strife monger and a sorcerer. And he used to cause a lot of trouble for mankind. He would get up to all sorts of stuff because he was um, a conjurer. He could turn himself into different animals and he would quite often disguise himself as a jaguar and go off out on adventures and stuff. And on one occasion, he lost his leg because he got into an argument with one of his enemies and they slammed a door on him and it chopped his leg off. So he ended up having to have a wooden leg. Now, because um, Quetzalcoatl was sick of Tez being such a 
strife monger and causing all of this trouble for humanity he basically turned him into a jaguar permanently and placed him up in the sky where he couldn't cause any more harm and where he was forced to hop around the pole on his wooden leg forevermore so i love the fact that this story is thought about the fact that there's a one-legged jaguar first of all that that's amazing but also the fact that if you've got a wooden leg it you can see that you're going to hop round in circles and therefore Tez is hopping around the pole star which I just think is absolutely awesome um, so I much prefer the Aztec mythology for that and for all of these because I one of the activities I do when I'm doing stuff in schools is I give people a pattern of stars and I tell them to come up with their own character and mythology and they really love it and get them to write a story about it as well and one of the things that um, if you look at different cultures, they don't draw the lines in necessarily the same way. So if you've got different stars in different positions, you can join them up however you like. It's your own personal dot to dot. And I always think that if you look at some of the stars uh, or take the plow and a few of the other stars, it kind of looks like a giant aardvark. Um, yeah, I, I quite like the aardvark idea, but I will never, ever look at Ursa Major and Minor and not see a bear thanks to my Ladybird book. Now, the Cygnus the Swan, this is another story that um, is really grim um, in Greek mythology. So I'm not going to kind of delve into too much detail on it because it's pretty horrible. But the swan is nestled right on the Milky Way. And that is important for the mythology within other cultures. But with them, the Greek mythology, it's a swan. And Cygnus had lots of different identities within the Greek myths. But Cygnus is most likely to be Zeus, who is in disguise. Now, the Spartan king um, had a really beautiful wife called Leda, and Zeus was in love with Leda and really wanted to woo her. And he knew that basically with her unrivaled beauty, there is no way that he would ever win her love looking the way that he did. So he turned himself into a swan and basically... Uh, as the swan, he was so beautiful that Leda couldn't resist him and there you go. The actual story is not really winning her over so much as forcing her into it and there are some very gruesome tales about Leda and the swan and it's it's horrible so I'm not going to go there but um, another story that I do like that there are a couple of variations of within Greek mythology as well involves two gods who were racing chariots in space and one of them is where two friends have a chariot each and they're racing each other in space and they get so focused on the race that they both want to win that what they just take their eye off the ball and they get too close to the sun and the sun basically melts their chariot and they both come falling down to earth one of them gets their full land kind of broken by bushes but the other one falls right down into the river and he can't swim so the friend that didn't land um, in the water basically is begging for the gods to let him save his friend and Zeus turned him into a swan because he was very moved by his want to actually kind of save his friend so he turned him into a swan and then he dove into the water got his friend out and saved his life and one version of it is that Zeus was still so moved by the bravery that he turned him into a swan and placed him into the heavens as a as a kind of mark of that bravery but another version of it there is one chariot and two friends and one of them falls into the water and drowns and the other friend basically just spends days and days and days trying to find the body so that he can bury the bones of his friend that passed away and Zeus basically acknowledges the bravery and you know his his love of his friend so he turns him into a swan and puts him into the the sky anyway so they're both involving kind of chariots melting and brave people um but basically i prefer the idea of sickness as being a mark of bravery rather than somebody that forces himself on unexpecting women now in chinese mythology their mythology actually spans the milky way in this period here this is one of my pictures from last summer and we have the star here, Vega, that is part of Lyra. And I'm going to talk about Lyra separately in a second. It's, but this is the summer triangle. We've got Deneb in Cygnus here. We've got Vega up there and, and with um, 
the bright star within Lyra and this is Altair and Basically, the, the story of the Magpie Bridge is the, involving these two characters and spanning the Milky Way. Now, this is a love story. So Zinu was a weaver girl, and basically she is symbolized by Vega. And Nui Lang is a cow herder, and he's symbolized by um, Altair. And basically, these two fell in love, but they're from completely different classes. So it's just not possible for them to be together. And their families banish them to opposite sides of the Milky River. Um, in a lot of mythology, the Milky Way is seen as a, a river. So they can't cross each other at all. They're, they're completely separated by this body of water. But once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh month, a flock of magpies form a bridge to reunite the lovers. And this is so beautiful. And this is actually, there's lots of variations on this, but it's the basis for Chinese Valentine's Day. And I really like the fact that you can take this, um, this is a picture that I found of Niu Lang um, and Zinu's story. It's an artwork by Warwick Coble, but I've put the stars on myself and you can see that this is the kind of constellation of Cygnus, but here the lines are drawn more involving the dress. And then the fact that the magpies are connecting all of this together, which is kind of essentially three constellations for us um which is unusual because chinese constellations are normally way smaller but i think that's a really beautiful story and i love this piece of artwork by warwick um so i've included that with my own star map just to give you your bearings but it just shows you how differently the sky can be interpreted in that way my mythology is I love the Hunger Games movies and the books and I think that this looks like Katniss with her long bow so just do this sometime. Just find your favourite constellations and just look at it with an abstract eye and think what shapes you can see with it. And I think that's a really good fun thing to do. Now we move on to Orion and we're kind of losing Orion now. And I'm always sad when Orion goes, but um, I really like one of the mythologies I'm going to talk to you about tonight is actually... Um, actually relevant the fact that Orion is a seasonal constellation. Now I love Orion because you can really see the colour difference between Betelgeuse the red giant and Rigel the blue giant and obviously it's full of really beautiful things if you're an imager and I, I really like that constellation a lot and I spend a lot of my spare time imaging things in it. Now, Orion is a hunter in many different mythologies and the Greek story, Orion was not a nice person really. And again, I've heard some really grisly tales that are told around Orion. So I've got a kind of tamed version of it here, but he was a hunter and basically his dad was the sea god Poseidon and his dad gave him special powers that meant that he could walk on water. And his mother was Uriel, who was a daughter of Minos, the king of Crete. So they were a very kind of high up family, uh, very well respected. But because Orion could walk on water, he used to just wander around the world and get up to mischief. And he basically walked across the sea and went to the island of Chios. And there he got drunk and attacked Merope, who is the daughter of their ruler, An Omipian. So in vengeance, Anipian actually blinded Orion and drove him away. Now, Orion stumbled off and ended up finding his way to Lemos, where Hypatius actually was a lame smith god. He had a forge there and Hypatius, Hypatius, I can't say these words, um, told his servant to guide Orion to the far east where Helios, the sun god, could heal him. So Orion did that. And then once he got his sight back, he returned to Chios to punish Onipium for making him blind in the first place. And he kind of can't blame the king for making him blind, to be honest. He kind of you know, tried to force himself on his daughter. Um, but the king hid away underground anyway, and he escaped um, Orion's wrath. But Orion was still this angry drunk, so he then marched off to Crete, where he ended up hunting with the goddess Artemis. And in the course of that hunt, Orion threatened to kill every living beast on Earth, which 
It's just not a very nice thing to do. Mother Earth obviously objected to this plan and sent a giant scorpion to sting and kill him. And the creature succeeded. And after his death, the goddess um, asked Zeus to place Orion up in the sky. And that was a memorial to the hero's death. And Scorpius is also added to the heavens. So the scorpion's on the opposite side of the sky. Um, so you don't tend to see these two constellations at the same time. In between the two of them is another constellation that is meant to have been an antidote to the scorpion poison so there are so many different variations of, of stories around this all of them involving orion being a not very nice person quite frankly so i think he deserved all he got <laughs> bring on the scorpions i say whenever i read any um stuff to do with orion i am really really in love with the Urquai mythology. I, I just love this story so much. <clears throat> so the Urquais said that long ago, there was a man who lived in a village and he'd grown too old to do any of his tasks. He couldn't do any chores. He couldn't go hunting anymore. He wasn't really feeling like he was contributing to the village anymore. And he became a burden to his family and felt that he was an outcast to others. So the old man knew that his days on earth were now fast windling and that he was going to have to go away. So he basically, to great effort, put a bundle on his back, walked up a mountain to get out of the, the way of the, the village and to, to go off on his next journey. When he reached the top of the, he had his walking staff in his hand as well. So he gets to the top of the mountain and he began to sing his death chant, which is just so heartbreaking. And basically the death chant is where he was singing for continuation of his spiritual journey after death to carry on in the next life his voice while he was singing his death chant drifted down to the village below and everybody stopped what they were doing and turned their eyes to look at this lone figure on the top of the mountain and as they watched the old man slowly began to rise into the air where he took his place there among the stars so that feels really sad but then you hear that when he got to that new life he assumed a new role and that new role where he gained his strength back and his new job was to carry the sun across the sky in the summer so that is why you don't see this constellation of the old man on the mountain because in the summer months the sun is above orion in the sky and he is carrying the sun across the sky but at the end of the the summer days he gets really tired so he needs to have a break so he hands that roll on to his son now his son is a lazy so-and-so and really can't be bothered to carry the sun very high so he does a kind of half assed attempt at it quite frankly and he just carries the sun very low in the sky there isn't much warmth not much light and that is when orion is in the night sky regaining the strength and then once He's rested and regains his strength again. He resumes his role where he then carries the sun much higher in the sky again and brings warmth and longer days back to the people. So I, I think that's such a beautiful story. So I, I did this little sketch myself for that one because I just thought it was so, so moving. I really liked it. So I prefer that to um, the other stories. Now with Orion, I think it looks just like an egg timer. Um, we also have, if you don't draw it like this and just draw it as a rectangle, we have a cookie jar that perfectly matches that profile. It's got a cat on it, but most people don't have a cookie jar with a cat on. So um, I've gone with egg timer for the McIntyre mythology there. Now, Orion, um, Orion Leo, um, obviously we're seeing a lot of Leo at the moment. Um, it's packed with galaxies and Leo is galaxy season for the images of the world. Now, Leo is actually one of the earliest recognized constellations. And there is actually archeological evidence that Mesopotamians had a similar constellation way back in 4000 BC. So it's a very, very old one. And this is um, Leo uh, above our house. And that's the, the lines drawn on there. So Leo is a lion and 
in Greek mythology, Leo is the lion that is killed by Heracles or Hercules. I'll come on to him separately in a second. Now, Leo, again, not a particularly nice character, not somebody I would want to meet. So he basically would lure women as hostages to his cave. He would capture women, get them in the cave and keep them there as hostages to try and lure hunters there who would come to rescue these damsels in distress. And of course, no weapon can kill the lion so he would just lure these people here and then they would come with clubs and swords and spears all of those weapons absolutely useless and then he would kill all of the hunters that came to rescue the maidens unfortunately the lion came a cropper because hercules was obviously big and strong, one of the strongest people that's ever lived, and he knew that his weapons were going to be useless. So he went up to the into the cave. As the lion pounced, he got up underneath, grabbed hold of the lion and basically snapped his spine in half and killed the lion that way. And then he went on and basically freed all of the women now some actually um, oh, sorry Zeus then commemorated him obviously by placing that labor of Heracles which is one of the many labors of Heracles by placing the lion up in the sky um, some mythologies believe that in Sumerian culture Leo was the monster Hubada who was killed by Gilgamesh so this gets into the epic of Gilgamesh as well so there are lots of different stories again around that when I do the constellation kind of redesign activity in schools, undoubtedly people that get Leo will come up with a mouse. And I had never noticed that it looks so much like a mouse until I did that activity the first time in the school. And it really does. I think it's quite an adorable little mouse. I think it also looks like one of those little push along cars. That, that's just what I see when I look at this in the sky. I'm just, I, I, I've never even had children of my own, so I've never had to push a child along in one of these, but that's what it looks like to me. I don't know what these things are even called, a push along car, I think. So I mentioned Lyra earlier on, and um, because the star Vega in Lyra featured in the, the Chinese mythology. And this is um, a very long exposure of the Milky Way that I did many years ago. And this is Vega here, very blue star and Altair is kind of quite yellow in color. It's quite a small constellation. And um, basically Lyra is a harp and the harp, it was the basically Orphucius, Orpheus, sorry, <laughs> all these names are so similar. Orpheus was um, the greatest musician that ever lived. And he used to venture into the underworld and his venturing into the underworld is what underpins a lot of the stories around this harp. This was the first lyre that was ever made. And it was actually invented by Hermes, the son of Zeus. And he fashioned it from a tortoise shell and he basically found that outside his cave. And then he cleaned out the shell, pierced its rim and tied seven strings of cow gut across it. Now the liar got Hermes out of trouble because in a youthful exploit, he stole some of Apollo's cattle and Apollo angrily came out to demand their return, but when he heard the really beautiful music that he was playing on the lyre, he actually let him off and he let him keep the cattle and took the lyre in exchange for that. Now, Orpheus later married um, Eridice and she died from a snake bite. Now, Orpheus had charmed the king of the underworld and the king of the underworld agreed that he could restore life back to his lost bride. And there was one little trick though. He could restore life to her, but when he came to collect her, he was forbidden from looking over his shoulder and actually looking at her. And when the time came, predictably, he just couldn't resist and she was brought back to life, but he turned around and looked over his shoulder at her and that was it. She had to return to the underworld forever. In Wales, this um, harp is said to be the harp of King Arthur or King David's harp as well. And the word Vega the, from the star comes from the Arabic words Al Nasser Al Wagi that mean either the swooping eagle or vulture. And actually some of the Arab mythologies see a tortoise or a goose. And yeah, I can kind of see that. 
um, that's really cool. So it's another kind of versatile con um, constellation, although it's quite small, it can be many things. And don't forget, constellations aren't the same way up all year round either. As you saw from my picture earlier, video earlier, they all rotate. So sometimes they're upside down compared to other times of year. I think this is a Star Wars at at. That is all I see when I look at this constellation. As I said, you don't have to join all the dots. You can draw the lines wherever you want, but th this just looks like an at at to me. So that's my McIntyre mythology for Lyra. Now, Hercules, um, as I mentioned before, is famous. Um, his name was Her 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 Hercules, but Hercules is the constellation name. And he was the son of Zeus or the son of Jupiter, depending which one you read. All the names are kind of a bit interchangeable. So he was the god of the sky and the god of thunder, and he ruled Mount Olympus as the king of the gods. Now, his mother was one of Zeus's lovers, and she was a mortal woman and Zeus took the boy and laid him at the breast of his wife, the goddess Hera or Juno. And there Heracles, like any newborn, suckled at her breast. And then having drunk the milk, he became immortal because she was you know, a, a god and she basically fed him her, her, her female goddess milk and made him immortal. But the king gave Heracles 10 tasks to fulfill and they were known as the, lab uh, the labors of Heracles. And to he did them all, but two of them were disqualified because he got help. So he had to go back and do another one. So he actually did 12 labors. Um, so yeah, that, that's when one of them was killing Leo the lion. I'm not gonna go through all 12 of the, the different labors. Um, there are many. So I th that's the kind of keystone shape of it there. And this is the shape of the hunter now, or the whatever he used to get up to during his labors. Quite often in the Northern Hemisphere sky, he is depicted upside down. There is a reason, but I can't remember what that reason is now. Um, but as I say, the constellations look different in different positions of the sky anyway. So there really isn't a right way up or a wrong way up. Now, this constellation is actually split in half within Chinese mythology. and. As I mentioned before, Chinese mythology is really interesting because they don't tend to have these big epic sagas and characters and stories. They're quite often, well, the, obviously the, the Magpie Bridge was one, but a lot of their constellations tend to be sort of more inanimate objects. And this constellation is split in two in Chinese mythology and the southern part, which is kind of dipping down into Ophiuchus, is actually a celestial market. The line of stars across the middle and that goes into Corona Borealis is the Celestial Records Office. Um, I think it's great that they've recorded a Celestial's record office in the sky. Um, and that's the place where you would register transactions in the markets. This would have been a very important place for their culture and for, for their trade, basically. Then on the northern part of Hercules is said to be a woman's bed, and this is in reference to the emperor's harem. So I don't have images for those ones, but that, that's basically what um, the Chinese think of Hercules and the bits around it. Um, I think that this just looks like a chicken that's ready to go in the oven. That's all I've ever seen when I look at this pattern in the sky. I just think of a raw chicken and I haven't even eaten meat for 30 years, but that is just what that looks like to me. Or if any of you are Friends fans, you remember Monica with the turkey on her head. That's pretty much what this looks like to me. So yeah, they can be all things to all people. <laughs> I also think it looks a bit like an octopus. Um, it, it don't know, just something about it kind of looks octopusy to me as well. So moving away from constellations per se, there are mythologies around other things in the sky that I want to briefly go through before I do the kind of sciencey bit about constellations. And this is the Milky Way, first of all. And as I mentioned earlier on, Jupiter wanted his illegitimate son to suckle at the breast um, of Hera so that he could get these immortal powers and stuff like that. 
<laughs> which is quite grim. And basically that is said to be um, the source of one of the stories of the Milky Way is that as a baby, he was already exhibiting legendary strength. He suckled so vigorously that he woke her up and Hera woke up and was absolutely furious at this reminder of his infidelity that she just grabbed him and pulled him away with a jerk, causing breast milk to squirt across the sky. So you'll never see the Milky Way the same way again after that. <laughs> More cultures tend to view it as a river of stars, thankfully, um, which is a little less grim than a, a river of breast milk. Um, sometimes seen as a pathway to heaven or a track of ashes. The Mongolians thought that it was a seam where two halves of the sky had been sewn together and particularly from a dark sky site you can actually see the dark bits in between and actually a lot of Australian and Aboriginal mythology the stories are about the dark bits in between rather than the bits around the outside. And the Polynesians, uh, oh, sorry, the, the Sumerians saw it as a giant serpent, and you can kind of see serpent the way that it kind of snakes across the sky. But um, Polynesians saw it as a giant cloud-eating shark. Um, I want to sign me up for some cloud-eating sharks, because that would be really handy living in the UK as an astronomer. And in Cherokee mythology, this is also fairly cool, um, the Cherokee mythology, it's a this, it's the spirit of a, a winged spirit dog that used to sneak in and steal cornmeal. And um, I, I think that's hilarious. And there are stories around people hiding out. They basically, they, they all hid and waited for this winged spirit dog to come, start stealing their corn. And then all at once, they all started banging their musical instruments and making an unholy amount of noise. And he flew away and scattered the corn across the sky as he flew away so I think that's awesome um, I want to get me one of these winged spirit dogs as well as a cloud eating shark I think that's really cool the Estonian mythology actually works into some of the the story around Aurora as well this is quite a sad story so she was a beautiful young woman called Lindu and she was um betrothed to the northern lights the northern lights had appeared with all his beauty managed to woo her into becoming betrothed and he said that he would return for their wedding but he never showed up again and she was so sad that her dad called the winds to lift her up into the night sky where she lays with her bridal veil blowing in the wind from one side of the sky to the other and that is such a sad story and you can completely see where this story comes from because the northern lights if you live at mid latitude is not something that happens very often so you could see that somebody has been wooed by these beautiful northern lights oh yeah promise you'll come back and then he doesn't come back for ages probably because we're in solar minima so this poor sad bride is destined to to sit in the sky forever waiting for her um, fiance to come back this story as well, I really like. It's um, the Soshon mythology and it's around a grizzly bear called Waken. And I really, really like this story as well. I don't know what it is about bears, but it, they just get me. He ended up coming last in a fight and he was banished to the land of the souls and he had to climb up a mountain to get there and as he got higher it began to snow and you know once he got above the tree line it was into the snow the snow was collecting on his fur but when he got there he started running so fast that he carried on and went off the top of the mountain and made it all the way up into the sky and as he went all the way up every single snowflake that blew off the fur actually became stars in the night sky and formed the milky way i think that is so beautiful i i really like waking the bear so yeah those sorts of stories move me far more than the the kind of greek mythology stuff now i mentioned aurora i have actually photographed aurora now 13 times from Oxfordshire. This was the best occasion, completely out of Milky Way season because this was on Midsummer's Night in 2015. Anybody north of Birmingham couldn't see it because it wasn't dark enough, but we were fortunate enough to see it and it was amazing. Now, I'm just going to play a little time lapse while I talk about the, um, the Cree Indians. Now, I've, I've heard 
um, lots of stuff about aurora being synonymous with spirits and the aurora was just basically part of the circle of life and they were the spirit of the dead who remained in the sky but distant from their loved ones now the Cree believed that the lights were actually spirits of the departed friends and relatives trying to communicate with those that had been left behind on earth now, Inuit tribes thought Aurora was the spirit of dead humans playing ball game with a walrus skull as the ball. And I think the origin of this, actually, there's another, um, the Nunavak um, island told a similar story, but for them, the Northern Lights was actually walrus spirits playing balls with the skull of some unfortunate human. The reason I'm interested in this is because I've heard stories from people that are in kind of polar regions during a really, really vivid aurora display that there is a sound associated with it and it's a kind of crackling sound. And I really hope one day I get to experience it because it sounds pretty amazing. I, I'll be honest, I was bawling my eyes out when this display happened in Oxfordshire. So if I ever did get to the northern regions and see it, I will be a blubbering mess. But I really like the idea idea that I've never kicked a skull but I imagine if you did it would make the kind of cracking sound that is synonymous with aurora displays so I, I suspect that because these stories are from people that are in fairly northern latitudes so you can imagine that there would have been a sound associated with it so there are many other um, aurora mythologies but most of them are, are kind of centered around spirits of some kind and you can see why it's very ethereal and very beautiful now, being the co-host of Comet Watch, I can't do a talk like this without mentioning comets. And comets um, were considered to, in equal measure to be either good omens or bad omens. And they're very often linked to deaths of kings or upcoming catastrophes or the birth of a great figure. And it's one of these things, if you look back at every bright comet we've had, how, how long is the time frame from someone dying for you to think they're associated? Because some of the stuff I've read, there could be a flood three years after a comet has been seen. So they're not really at the same time, but it, it's, you give these guys their due, they didn't know what comets were. And you know, they basically in 44 BC, a comet was linked to the deification of Julius Caesar. And in North mythology, it said that the flakes of the skull of the giant Ymir falling from the sky. So there's lots of mythology around their form, but there's also um, quite a lot of stuff from ancient you know, Chinese were just phenomenal astronomers and amazing record keepers. And I love these um, Mawang Dewey silk textbooks, they basically have recorded every single cometary form and then the various disasters that were associated with them. And this was compiled from knowledge dating all the way back as far as 1500 BC, but it was compiled around about 300 BC. So you can see you're always going to find a natural disaster to attribute to a comet when you're looking back that far back. But I think to give them their due, we didn't know where comets were. We knew they were different from everything else, but people didn't know what comets were, where they came from, and whether they did actually have any impact on Earth. And this is where the whole astronomy, astrology thing started to split apart, because in the old days, everything was astrology. And people were genuinely looking to see whether the placement of the stars or the appearance of a comet or a meteor shower would have any effect on terrestrial weather or any other things that happened on Earth. And of course, they realized that this wasn't the case. And this is where things split off because astrology was starting to get off into divination and kind of making up crazy stories about what's going to happen to you next Monday. So that's kind of where it split. But originally, people were looking at comets with a view to figuring out whether this was something that was going to cause a natural disaster, because they just didn't know that. But either way, I think these silk textbooks are absolutely beautiful and they're compiled from generations of knowledge that have been kept and they're so beautiful. Um, so I really like those. Now meteor showers and we, we have four meteor cameras and meteor showers were also thought to be a bad omen and you'll quite often see things referred to as comet stars and comet stars were recorded in August of number of 30 BC which was thought to be a portent 
important witnessed after the death of Cleopatra. It's also thought to have been the Perseids meteor shower. So that just coincided with the time Cleopatra died. So it was obviously attributed to her. But Perseids have also been connected to the martyrdom of St. Lawrence, and they're said to be the tears of the saint. So I, I still think meteor showers are an absolute wonder to behold. And luckily, I, you know, we, if I am tired, I know we have four cameras covering a lot of the sky, plus a radio meteor rig like Simon has. And you can always see that diurnal increase as well. There's always more meteors before dawn and you know, you've just got to be out there to see them. And like everybody else, I missed the peak this year because I had four seizures on the day of the actual peak turning up. So I couldn't even set up a camera that night. But luckily, our, our meteor cameras caught it. So I still think meteor showers are amazing. And you know, we do know that they don't really have any impact on Earth, fortunately. Now, Simon mentioned at the beginning that I love atmospheric optical effects, and that, that's an entire talk that I do all of its own. But I was interested in the, the and I actually want to put together an entire talk on the legends of things that aren't actually constellations. And one of the things that we see a lot of are crepuscular rays. And actually, of all the atmospheric optics that has almost caused me to crash my car the most number of times, crepuscular rays feature quite highly. And we see this sort of artwork um, depicting crepuscular rays within religious works all the time. Um, so saints, angels, all of those things always have these rays kind of appearing out from them. And you can kind of understand why people would have thought that. And back in the days when people were very like strong believers, you've got these little punch holes in the sky and these kind of heavenly rays coming out towards you. It's just the, the names of them. They're sometimes called fingers of God, heavenly rays. They're all just synonymous with religious stuff, basically. And so crepuscular rays are often tied up with that sort of mythology. And also halos, um, as in a halo around your head, this is something called the heligan shine. Basically, if you are out in the morning where there's a lot of dew on the ground or frost and the sun is still very low, I do have a picture of this of my own, but it's not as good as this one. You can kind of see around your head at the anti-solar point, you can get a brightening effect and it's caused by backscatter from the water on the blades of grass. But what's interesting to me with all atmospheric optical effects is that they are only visible to your eyeballs. And if somebody stands to the right of you, what they're seeing is their own personal one. And this is evidenced here. You hold your phone out to the side. The heligan shine is around your arm that's taking the picture. So the center of this is around the eye of the beholder, literally. So when you it's you, it's your eyes, therefore it's around your head. If you hold your camera out to the side, it'll be there. If you put your camera on a tripod and do it, it will be around the camera on the tripod. So I think that might be where this idea of halos has come from as well. And this is another thing that you can quite often see called a Brocken spectre. And in Germany, the Brocken is the highest peak in the Heinz Mountains. And for 300 days of the year, it's shrouded in mist. If you get the sun behind you with a misty kind of landscape in front of you, you get what's basically the same as a corona that you often see around the moon when there's thin cloud or around the sun when there's thin cloud about. But it's also accompanied by this huge long gray shadow. And this, um, the spectre of the Brocken is the tr literal translation, but it's um, the Brocken spectre. You can actually make one artificially with your car headlights on a foggy night, which is fun to do. But even knowing what this is, if I saw this at the side of a hill, I would be terrified. And there's a lot of um, mythology in Scotland. There's the legend of um, the big grey man of Mac Dewey and also the Scottish Bigfoot. And this is associated with groaning and crunching sounds and then obviously accompanied by this huge grey shadow which obviously looks like this shadowy figure coming to get you and will follow you if you run away because it's your own shadow and basically this is where you get that weird thing happening with sound when you're in hills and the crunching will be echoing your footsteps will be echoing the wind will be groaning and so I can imagine this being quite a scary thing but there's yeah definitely legends around um 
Brock inspectors um, from that sort of area. And when we talk about other, like you mentioned sun dogs, we quite often see these little bright patches either side of the sun. They're called mock suns. Quite often, parhelia is the Greek Germanic word meaning beside the sun. And quite often, you get displays like that accompanied by these sort of cross shapes. And you, the first pictorial bible that was ever made is the Nuremberg Chronicle and they depict the Holy Trinity in this way and there is no doubt in my mind that this is atmospheric optical effects that are being portrayed as a religious thing and that happens quite a lot and also during the first century AD the playwright Seneca was using the word beside the sun and it was actually, there was a really famous occurrence of this. It was um, 1461, the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. The troops came out and were faced with this apparition of, um, I think the words were two glorious sons, each a perfect son. And they were terrified. The troops were terrified. They thought this was some kind of, they had the cross shape, they had the mock sons, and they thought they were about to go and march off to their death. They were terrified. But he managed to, the head of the troops managed to talk them around and say, no, this is a good symbol. It means we're going to be victorious. And they did go off and actually be victorious. And this was such an important event that um, the guy who was the, the head of the, the army actually ended up putting little sons on his family crest afterwards. And that scene is reenacted. And any of you that know your Shakespeare will remember the, the line, dazzle mine eyes, or do I see three sons? That is from Henry VI, part three. And that is a recreation of that exact event. So this was obviously really a, a very important um, thing. With regards to the name actual sun dog, I, Basically, every single um, culture from around the world has got sky gods that have some kind of um, two twin sons of some kind. Sometimes it's two dogs that are very loyal to their owner. Sometimes it's two sons. And literally every single cult civilization within the world has a version of it. And just so many ancient writings talk about it and in Greek mythology there was Zeus and there was also reference to Dioscuri which translates of sons of God as well and this is two sets of twin sons in the sky and both of them like obviously referring to this sort of apparition there are stories from China and Babylon and India all featuring twin sky gods and actually and also women that were gave birth to um, twins were said to have some children of the sky so that kind of goes back there to kind of Maya and New York sort of area and there are ancient cave carvings in Scandinavia as well that talk about these um, depicting these twin figures and it's quite often said in the modern day that halos mean it's going to rain if you see one of these and it doesn't it, it does sometimes it depends they're quite often seen in cirrostratus clouds on the edge of a weather front so it depends whether the weather front is coming towards you or away from you I've seen halos after days of rain and then I've also seen halos at the end of a load of rain and then followed by two weeks of sun. So you can't predict the weather by them really other than a weather front has moved. So some of the science about constellations in modern day, I'll just zoom through this because I've spoken for ages already. But when we talk about constellations now, we're not talking about just the bright stars that make up the pattern of the, the mytho mythological constellation. The whole sky has been broken up into these really difficult to get your head around chunks. <laughs> so if you hear of something in Hercules, for example, it means it's within this jagged patch of sky where Hercules happens to reside. So in the modern day, the, just the meaning of constellation has a slightly different meaning because it's not just referring to the brighter stars. In one of the favorite things that I think has happened for me in astronomy um, has been the Hubble Space Telescope, obviously, but specifically the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. And 
This is a patch of sky that is probably about the size of the head of a pin held at arm's length. This is the full moon. I and mean, the moon isn't as big as people like to think it is. It's actually quite small. It's only like half a degree across or something. Um, so this is a really, really tiny patch of sky. And they imaged it for a really, really long time. And they got this picture out of it. And what every dot, almost every dot, apart from this one here, which is a foreground star, every dot in this picture is galaxies. And it's mind blowing. And this is in a, a fairly empty patch of sky as well. They deliberately chose a patch of sky where it doesn't really look like there is anything. So what they've done here is 10 years worth of imaging. So it makes my 24 hour star trails look like nothing, to be honest. This is 23 day total exposure time. So that, that's just next level. Um, but it's taken 10 years of accumulating that data and it shows 15,000 or more galaxies in that piece of sky the size of a pinhead. If there are 15,000 looking there, there are going to be 15,000 probably on almost all the other patches of sky as well, which is just an utterly mind blowing fact in itself. But what really blows my mind about this is that it's showing galaxies as they looked 13.2 billion years ago, because this telescope is probing so deep. So this was 8.6 billion years before our solar system was even created. And it's taken 13.8 billion years for those light photons to hit the sensor on the Hubble Space Telescope camera. And that's amazing. And if this doesn't make your brain hurt, you've not understood it, is how I always think about um, these really deep images. So our sun is our nearest star. And in terms of distance, it's 150 million kilometers. So we call that one AU because 150 million is a lot of zeros to write down. And having one AU makes the maths a lot easier. So in terms of outreach, we might use AU. And um, people don't ever really use AU in science. But in terms of distances in how long it would take to travel to the sun, in a, in a car on a 70 mile an hour motorway, it would take 150 years. There are basically not enough Maltesers in existence for me to want to do a 150 year car journey. But even on our fastest passenger jet, it would take 18 years. And even Apollo space craft was the fastest thing that we have built today and I was very sad to hear that Mike Collins passed away just before I came on to do this talk that that's really really sad news but the Apollo astronauts were traveling the fastest that anyone's ever traveled with humans on board and that would still take five months to get to our sun so we're talking some big distances here and that's the nearest one but after the sun our nearest sun is Alpha Centauri so how far away is that? Surely we can go and visit it. Well, it's 40 trillion kilometers away. And this is so big that we're now having to start using light years because AU isn't going to cut it when you're talking about 40 trillion kilometers. So one light year is 9.4 trillion kilometers. So it's a lot easier to say one light year than it is to say 4.9 trillion. Certainly easier to put one in a calculator than to do 9.4 trillion zeros. But yeah, it, it's a long way away. So in terms of distance, if we were to go there in the fastest manned space, crewed spacecraft that's ever been built, it would take 123,000 years to get there. So I'm going to talk about exoplanets in a minute. And while I am super excited about exoplanet research, I don't think we can get overly excited about Earth 2.0 just yet, because this is our nearest neighbour. And it would take us 123,000 years to get there in a spacecraft that was only built to last a few days. There's no way you could take an interstellar journey in this. So the distances are vast. Our most distant star, though, is 9 billion light years away. So remember, that's one light year. So it's 9 billion times 9.4 trillion. A long way. Now, I mentioned before about stars that within constellations and asterisms not actually being that near each other or related to each other. And I actually made a model. Uh, it was one of my Sky at Night articles. Um, I was inspired to make this actually by something I saw at the Denver Science Museum. And this is to scale. If you stand um, five feet in front of this, 
basically you are seeing those stars in terms of distance at the actual scale distance away from Earth. So when you see it from the front, it looks like the plow, how we are familiar with it. But if you turn it through 90 degrees and imagine you're standing kind of similar distance off to the right, this is to scale how far apart those stars are from each other. And we're talking 100 light years here in terms of depth of this box. So even the ones that look like they're near each other actually just aren't. And that's just looking at distance. It's not looking in terms of side to side distances because we can't do that from our vantage point here on Earth. So that they just take my word for it. They're nowhere near each other. It's just a line of sight effect. Now, one of the things I really love is star clusters, and this is the OWL cluster or the ET cluster. And this is something that um, I, I should do more of because cluster photography is quite easy to do lots in one night and they're really pretty. But when you look at star clusters like that, you can see that stars are all different magnitudes and we have the magnitude scale. And when you look at constellations on a star map, they're all labeled and the brighter ones will begin with like alpha. So it'll be alpha Orionis, beta Orionis, etc. And then it would carry on down. And the magnitude scale, the lower the number, the brighter it is. But this is a logarithmic scale. So each of these steps is 2.5 times brighter than the previous one. So the difference between a mag minus one and a mag four is 100 times brighter rather than just four steps brighter. So it, you've got to remember that it's a log scale when you look at that. So that's why we have those. And Polaris, whenever I go into schools, is this on clubs um, like beavers and scouts and stuff there's this misconception that the pole star is the brightest star in the sky and it just isn't it's only mag plus two and if you don't know where to look for it it's quite hard to find sometimes so it's really not that bright vega very bright mag zero but the brightest star in the northern hemisphere is sirius and you saw my photograph of that defocus to capture the colors it really does scintillate very beautifully and it's the brightest northern hemisphere star that we have now just for scale, Venus is mag minus four, so Venus is way brighter. The full moon is minus 13, and it doesn't feel like that big a jump, but remember this is each order of magnitude is 2.5 times the previous one, so it's quite bright. And the sun is mag minus 27, so don't ever look at the sun without proper protection. Now, some stars are bound together by gravity, and particularly star clusters. And there are two sorts of clusters that we have. We've got open clusters and globular clusters, double cluster in Perseus, everybody's favorite binocular object, I think. And this is the owl cluster that I showed you before. Some of them are slightly more tightly packed than others. And they are, they do tend to be, a lot of them are sort of gravitationally bound, but not so much as um, globular clusters are. Some clusters are not as gravitationally bound as we first thought they were. Some of them, like the Pleiades, are completely covered in gas and dust. And there's a lot of questions, actually, about whether the Pleiades is the age we thought it was, whether these stars were born of this gas cloud, or whether their foreground just happened to be passing through. I, I read something about it recently. But either way, it's beautiful. It's my favorite night sky object, hands down. I just love it. And this is my favorite photo graph I've taken of it. Um, this is Messier 13 and Omega Centauri. O Omega Centauri I don't think is visible from the northern hemisphere, but these are globular clusters and you can see straight away that these are very, very different. There are tens and tens of thousands of stars all packed together in a tight ball and then you've got some kind of interlopers around the outside and some of them more tightly packed than others. One of my favourites is uh, Messier 13, it's in Hercules, so that, that's well placed now to, to observe and you can see that with binoculars. They're very, very pretty. And one thing you'll notice in here and these both of these pictures is the star colours. And that isn't an artefact. Um, actually, stars can be different colours and they, te they tend to belong to different spectral classes and they're also different temperatures. And I always like to ask the trick question of children, whether the blue ones are hotter or the red ones, because we're all conditioned to think that blue is cold and icy, but actually the blue stars are the ones that are burning way hotter. And this is the um, OB, a fine girl, kiss me is how I was taught to remember the spectral scale. I'm not going to read all of this, but basically they're all different temperatures, different color classes, and they all have different compositions that we know by looking at spectra of them. 
And in terms of size, they can vary massively in real terms. And it's not just a, a kind of line of sight that we're nearer to one than the other. O-class stars like Rigel, these blue supergiants are absolutely huge. So our sun, and um, just to put some scale here, this is the size of Earth compared to our sun. So it, it's huge. But and this is a photograph that I took in 2015, the biggest solar prominence I've ever seen. And that white dot there and there is the Earth to scale compared to, to this whole disk of the sun. But our sun compared to Betelgeuse is even smaller than Earth is compared to our sun. So Betelgeuse is really big and that's not even the biggest. Um, the blue supergiants are even bigger than that. So it's, um, it, it's really interesting to just look at the different sizes and j just compare everything and kind of see how things go. In terms of life expectancy, the overall mass of the star will determine how long they live. And I mean, even a short lifespan in astronomical terms is quite long. But if you've got a, a star that is kind of 150 times approximately bigger than our sun, it's going to survive for about 3 million years. And these are the ones that cause a supernova explosion at the end of their life. They expel 10 billion times the power output of our sun in a matter of minutes. And they're just amazing. And whenever we see a supernova, it can outshine an entire galaxy from one star. They really do kick out some power and they're kicking out stuff in wavelengths that aren't visible to the naked eye as well. So supernova is just a really amazing thing. Now, stars like our sun, they will live for about 10 billion years. So we don't need to worry yet. When they get to the end of their life, yeah, we're about halfway through, not even halfway through its life expectancy. When they die they start to cool a little bit and then they swell out and form a red giant star and then at the end of their life they kind of shrivel and become a white dwarf star um, so they don't end quite as spectacularly as the the bigger mass stars but the smaller ones the ones that are way smaller than our sun can exist for 10 trillion years it's just unbelievable but they just burn out slowly they just shrink and disappear they don't have a kind of final swan song the way that a, a high mass star might do so how many stars are there <laughs> the age-old question just in our galaxy we think there are between 100 to 400 billion um, which is a lot but all the stars that we can see with the naked eye are only a thousand light years from Earth. And our Milky Way galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across. So we can only see a tiny fraction of them. We're kind of out here on one of these spiral arms. I think the model of the exact structure of the Milky Way is it improved slightly since that picture was taken. But I just want to finish with some exoplanet stats because I think exoplanets is one of the most exciting areas of research in astrophotography. As of yesterday, this goes up almost daily. So whenever I do this talk, I've got to go in the night before and check. But as of yesterday, we have now discovered 4,375. I can still remember when we discovered the first. The minute you find one other than yourself, you're not unique anymore. And you know that everywhere. It's kind of as long as we're the only one we know about, we just have to assume it's unique the minute you find one other you know that that's it it's everywhere it has to be widespread everywhere and we're now detecting these readily on almost daily basis the different detection methods um will favor different things so the transit method is the one that picks up the bigger stars and is is the the most commonly used method for picking those up and that is the the one that kind of is always in the the leaderboard in terms of how many it's found the radial velocity method is kind of looking at the <clears throat> the way that a planet in orbit around a star is causing it to wobble and they can do really meticulous measurements on that and figure out the exoplanet data and um, so there's about 837 have been done that way and micro lensing is another big one where you've got a galaxy or something of high mass between you and it and it the micro lensing means that you get to see it so I'm not an expert on gravitational lensing by any means but there are um, in terms of the sizes um, compared to earth masses we are obviously favoring the bigger stuff more, um, but quite often the two to six Earth radii is the, the most common kind of stat. So I, I think 
it's again down to the detection method. There's always biases in the way that the detection methods are working. There's probably an even spread of all of these. And here you can see that this data is obviously skewed because the majority of them are, are bigger than Earth masses that we found. And that's because they're the ones that are easier to spot from Earth. It's quite simply that. And I'm sure that there are going to be tens of thousands more that are going to be found in coming decades with better and better um, technology. 4,000 exoplanets, when the 4,000 were discovered, I'm just hopefully this will play because it's on YouTube, what they've done is put together um, a kind of interactive map, show us a video showing where each one was found relative to the whole sky. So this is a projection of the entire sky and it just shows you new dots as they appear as new exoplanets were discovered and it was slowly at first and then all of a sudden they've, they've made this piece of music all of a sudden they're just appearing in their droves and i think this is really beautiful visualization and kind of has more impact than looking at a bar graph So you can see there is no special area here. This is the whole sky, basically. <laughs> amazing so that was the first kind of 4003 that have been discovered so obviously these are a long way away so we don't need to get excited um but because of the detection methods and the capability we have with our instruments the majority of our exoplanet research all the exoplanets we found have been predominantly in this kind of disk here with a few pointing out that way and there's been when i last updated this as of the 15th of April, this this was the most distant that had been found and it was kind of way off on one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. There is a whole galaxy yet to explore, not to mention the ones that are around stars in other galaxies. So exoplanets are going to be everywhere and I think that's a very, very exciting place to, to be. So the most distant that we found is 13,000 light years away but there's still, they're going to be everywhere and it's just a matter of time. So I'm just going to finish by talking about what these constellations mean to me now. I've talked a lot about the mythology. I've talked a lot about the science of the night sky. But for me, these constellations, they're, they're my playground. They're where I go to de-stress. They're where I go to test my capabilities with my camera and to learn new imaging and image processing techniques, the where I go to help increase my creativity from an art perspective with drawing, space art, painting, doing actual accurate sketches, they're where I could just sit out every night and de-stress with a pair of binoculars. They're places that I found photographed supernovas. I photographed the progenitor of the nova that was found recently. They're just basically my playground. And I never, ever, ever get bored of looking at these constellations. And there are still constellations I struggle to identify despite being out there every night. But I try and make a point of every time I'm just out with my binoculars, I try to commit to memory another constellation that I'm not as familiar with. And they will always mean that to me. But ultimately, as I said before, every time I look, at the constellations that I learned in this book, I am seeing this artwork. I'm seeing that smiling bear looking down at me. And the first time I ever saw Ursa Minor, I was in my 20s because I used to live in a light polluted area. And yet again, astronomy caused me to cry because I saw it and I was like, I've finally seen that little bear. And those stars will always mean that to me. So I, I hope you found that interesting. Um, obviously, I will answer any questions that you have. Um, I'm not an expert on the Greek myths by any means because I don't like them very much. I think they're horrible, most of the stories, but I hope you enjoyed some of the other mythologies that you might not have heard before. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'm sure we've got a, a few questions that people would like to ask. So uh, dive in. I, uh, you can unmute yourselves now. I was going to ask one sort of uh, do you have do you have a favorite constellation Mary? 
the Pleiades. <laughs> it's predictable, isn't it? But I like blue. The thing is, I really love blue. That's probably why I like this book, because the cover's blue. But I really like blue. And you can really see the blue colour when you look at that cluster, even when you can't see the nebulosity with the naked eye. You can tell there's something about it's got a blue quality to it that I just really, really love. And so it's always the Pleiades for me. It's not going to forget the chicken. Yeah, I, I just I don't know why that's all I see is a raw chicken. It's quite weird when I look at Hercules. <laughs> uh, there's another question that came to me and might be uh, slightly of an age, but um, uh, we're rewriting histories. We're tearing down statues for inappropriate symbols from our past. Should we really be rewriting the stories of the constellations and changing the books? So that they don't long, uh, uh, no longer refer to some of these terrible acts that uh, never really occurred, but the mythology uh, behind them. Should we rewrite them? That's a really tough question. I think we should learn from them. Um, completely rewriting stuff isn't the way to go. We should use it as a learning thing. And and they were written in a very different time and you can't judge past mm. things by present day values that's something that's really important and I, I mean i don't think that we should be writing children's book that are talking about um a swan raping a young girl i think that's horrific and some of these stories in children i mean the when i i always tone them down so much when i do talks in young in schools because they always want the mythology stories and they are lapping it up i don't know if children these days are exposed to more stuff but they don't seem affected by it if i'd read the versions of these stories that are in my stepchildren's kids books when i was <coughs> little i would have been traumatized i really would I, I i don't like them at all maybe i'm just unique in that i, I really don't know but i think we should maybe make a point that I, I don't know. I, I guess with some of the mythologies, if some good comes from it and they're punished for the awful acts, it'd be fine. But they seem to not be a lot of the time. But then so many of the stories have been diluted and changed. And I don't know what the original ones are anymore. And as I say, I've never seen the same version of any of these myths twice. They, they're just different and different names and interchangeable characters. And it, it's just really difficult. So, so I guess I, I really don't know whether we should, be, I don't think we should be rewriting it, but use it as an opportunity to teach that that's not a way to behave. And if you're gonna behave like that, you don't deserve to be immortalized in a romantic sky constellation or have a star named after you. <laughs> it's open to everyone. So you can unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Or even make your points, uh, what, what you feel about constellations and see if Mary uh, shares your feelings. Do any of you actually make your own stories and characters up like I do? I'm interested to hear that. I, no. I do, <laughs> well, I, I, I actually find remembering the constellations difficult. So I, I just kind of come up with the patterns as you, that you've done with the school kids um, and sort of come up with my own little, uh, sort of areas to remember. And it makes it a little bit easier, especially when they're sort of uh, upside down or where you go abroad and you've gone uh, further south in latitude. It Suddenly you're getting a bit confused by the night sky again. Uh, oh, gosh. So when I went to the Maldives, I was spinning out because I, I, I just didn't know where anything was. And half of it I didn't recognize. And I would bought a southern hemisphere planisphere already. I could not get my head around it. And I felt like a complete beginner must feel like daunted by the entire thing. And in the end, I just thought, I'm just going to look up and think mm, beautiful star, starry sky and leave it at that. I'm not going to ruin my holiday by trying to turn it into a, an astronomy lesson. But it, it is really nice to see a different sky. And I hope that I get to see the southern hemisphere sky properly sometime. I, I always think um, there's scope for a new myth as to why um, the number of constellations is the same as the number of keys on a on a piano. So I think ah. Well, only in one culture, because every culture has a different number of them. But, um, 
Yeah, I was really surprised to find that. I mean, it's it's not really surprising when you think about it, but no two parts of the world are going to have come up with the same things because constellations were named after things that were important to people and the Greek sagas. Um, I, I don't think they made up those stories. They were based on stories already and then they just immortalized them in the sky. And you saw with the Chinese stuff, it's a very different set of things. It's a, a marketplace or a, a place where you pay the tariffs on the sale of the goods that you've sold that day. There's nothing in Greek mythology that's quite like that. We have a few objects rather than people, but the stories are more colorful, but I much prefer some of the other mythologies like waking the bear and the old man carrying the sun around the sky. I think it's so beautiful. And I like the one as well with Aurora coming to woo her and then disappearing again and never showing his face again. Sounds like a lot of guys, but <laughs> but I quite like that because you can really see how that the idea of that has come from. It must have been written somewhere that didn't see the northern lights very often because they were at the wrong latitude. Whereas the guys further north are writing stories about walruses playing football with a human skull because they see Aurora every night. You know, it's just very different. I find it really interesting looking at the, the differences. I did like I did like the old man story. That was really nice. That was my favourite. I think. Oh, yeah. It is it a complete con? I had a, a star named after me. Is that just a complete con um, that they that they do? <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I guess he was nodding faces. <laughs> it kind of is because the International Astronomy Union, I think it is, are the only people that are allowed to officially name something. So there are a lot of these companies where you can have a star named, but the only people that will ever recognize that name is that company. And if you read the small print, they will tell you that it will never be known as that by anybody else. So basically you've paid for somebody to just go on a computer, randomly pick a star and print a map and send it to you. And it that that's it. But equally, I had somebody buy me an acre of the moon. Somebody's made a fortune selling 20 quid acres of the moon which means nothing because yeah. obviously we can't sell the moon <laughs> so but I stupidly I kind of quite like it but on the flip <laughs> side of that I know two people that have lost close relatives and somebody has named a star in their memory and although that star is not ever going to really be known by that person. What I've done is on their behalf, I've taken a photograph. If these guys would at least take a picture of the star and give you a decent photograph of it, it'd be something. Mm -hmm. But you get uh, just the cheapest printer paper with it written on. Um, and I, I know how much comfort that that canvas of my photograph of their daughter's star has brought to that family. So I always used to think it's an absolute swizz. They must should all be done for fraud quite frankly but on the flip side I've seen how much comfort that photograph of a star has given to that family so part of me is kind of thinking well but but the people that are doing it don't care about that they're just making money quickly and fraudulently as far as I'm concerned but I can see where the comfort comes from I mean I had I had a star named after me in the 90s so it's not a new thing and at the time, I remember I got all this official stuff and I was like, oh, my God, it's actually a star named after me. It, it, it isn't. <laughs> and the same star has been named multiple times by every single company that uh, set us up to do this. I think mine was from the 90s as well. It came with a nice certificate. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and, and it is a bit of fun. As long as people that buy it understand that, then it's fine. But I think a lot of non-astronomers don't realise that what they're buying isn't legitimate. It's it, it's not an actual legitimate name at all. Yeah, please go and find the Ladybird books on eBay if you can. Um, somebody has mentioned about the importance of the night sky to Muslims. That's something I talk about a lot in my women in astronomy talk because um, the, Mus the Muslim world were phenomenal astronomers. And honestly, the astrolabe collection from the Muslim part of the world in the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, I was lucky enough to have a private tour of it as part of a party somebody had. And I was like, can I just move in for the week? Because they are beautiful. And 
the, the instruments they made were fantastic. They were really precise. They really kind of knew their sky. And because the sky was important to them, there were lots of people that lived within the Muslim world, women in particular, that were doing calendar keeping and almanacs and all of that stuff. So people knew where to look for things and when. So it's, it's a really important part of that part of the world. And their, their skill in making those instruments was second to none you look at them and it looks like something that could have been manufactured to the highest quality today and these are really old instruments they are stunning I can't wait to go back there and go and look at them again because they were so beautiful uh, when you're allowed to travel you must go to Oxford and ju just to go to the Astrolabe cabinet because it's worth it the, the BBC recently had a radio programme um, and the subject was the, the fact that Geoffrey Chaucer of Canterbury Tales uh, fame um, had wrote, wrote really um, an authoritative guide on how to use an astrolabe, uh, you know, which was uh, current for centuries after he'd, he'd written it, which I found very interesting. Amazing. Yeah. I made one of those, you know, you can get those cardboard kits that make replicas of old astronomical instruments I don't think they're going to be selling in the UK anymore thanks to the b word but um I, I've got a couple of them and I actually made a, an astrolabe cardboard one I, I still haven't quite got my head around how to use it though it's um but it, it's really fun that they're really good instruments and there's a really nice picture of um oh god her name's gone out of my head but there's one of the ladies that I talk about in my women in astronomy talk and there's a painter really beautiful painting of her holding her astrolabe up to the sky and it's so so lovely and they were really important those portable instruments because like you say you can't lug Stonehenge around with you to measure things so but the, the, the whole set of these old ladybird books I, I, I bought a couple of them because I was I couldn't quite remember the title of this particular one and I bought a couple and I got them I thought, I've seen these before and I love them but it's not the one and then suddenly I saw this I'm like that's the one that's the one but you can get them on eBay fairly inexpensively and I think Amazon have a used book marketplace as well where you may be able to get them but th this never leaves my side now it, I just this book is so special to me even though it's not the original one I don't care and it's just lovely <laughs> it had everything it's got the star maps it's got the artwork it's got the mythology stories it's just lovely do do the with the mythology do they actually cover stories of the planets moving through the constellations as well or did, or did they just omit the planets as they moved through the constellations I, haven't, I mean, I know that like kind of Jupiter is the god of thunder and I think the planet names were named after some of the gods, but I don't know specifically much about the movement of the planets, I guess, because they were kind of wandering off doing their own thing, because a lot mm. of the stories center around a particular time of year and a season. And of course, the moon and the planets don't necessarily follow that. So I don't know whether it's just something I haven't seen when I've been researching this but I haven't noticed anything about it you hear stuff about specific stars like when a star is like Sirius for example in Egypt and when it appears in a certain spot you know the Nile is going to flood and it's nothing to do with the star itself it's just that's the season where the Nile floods and it just so happens to coincide with the star so it was quite a useful thing to be aware of because it did help you with growing food and when to harvest and that type of thing but I know that with the Native American almanacs they did name all the full moons so the, the be like the last one that we just had is the pink moon and that's because there was a particular flower that is in bloom during April when we get the full moon um, so it's absolutely meaningless to the UK so is the wolf moon we don't have wolves roaming the UK but I kind of quite like those names. I know a lot of the diehard astronomers really don't like them, but I, I quite like them because it was the name that was relevant to those people at the time. And you know, I, I, I think they're really nice. So we get the strawberry moon, which does coincide with um, when our strawberries are in harvest. The harvest moon, 
is often very big and very orange and that's just because the time of year it's very humid and it does look very orange I once took a picture of the rising strawberry moon and it was bright pink and from then on all my non-astronomy friends were like oh I didn't know it actually turned pink and it's all like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> So, um, so yeah, then I, I like those names and there's actually several different versions of those Native American full moon almanac names as well and different parts of the world have different names for each full moon and then they were very relevant to those cultures and the way they lived their lives so I do quite like those names. They're completely irrelevant to us here in the UK most of the time though. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll tolerate a bit of supermoon talk. Uh, I hate yeah. super. Uh, the word supermoon drives me up the wall, but I'll I'll take the strawberry moon and I'll, the worm moon. Uh, I'd, I'd I'd love to be wherever it was that you basically just name a moon after how many worms you can see. So that's horrendous. <laughs> so Wendy, did you have a question? Oh, I was just thinking about your little ladybird books, Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are they? Are they still available to buy as new books, that, that kind of thing? Do you know? I don't think so. I think these are all, all the ones I've seen are secondhand ones. They're very old. I mean, this was an old book when I was at school in the late 70s. So they're very, very old well, now. They've probably got, uh, there'll probably be a version. Yeah. I'll have they to they still print shop. Ladybird books. They've probably got new ones. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I think they still print Ladybird books, but they've all been kind of brought up to date. I'm sure there'll be something similar that you can get that is inspiring the next generation. <laughs> we'll all have to get down to Book Barn and uh, have a hunt around to see if we can uh, get hold of some of those uh, old books or campaign to get them reprinted. You never know. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Mary uh, for her wonderful talk on constellations and uh, all the aspects from the mythology uh, and in terms a new interpretation as well. I, I'm going to see that chicken in the um, atat uh, now every time I go out. Um, Love the atat, yeah. <laughs> uh, but as we close, I just want us to remember uh, Michael Collins, who died today. Um, he was in the command module. He's the one who looked down as Buzz and Neil walked on the moon. He's the one who had orders that if something went wrong, he was to leave them there. Um, but luckily, uh, it all worked. Well, not luckily, through a bit of luck, perhaps, and a lot of science, <laughs> uh, he, met, he met up with his, uh, his buddies again and he came back safely. Um, but today he passed away. Um, so uh, just one left of the original um, uh, moon landers so uh, fingers crossed that in the coming years there'll be um, new feet stepping on the moon but uh, he never got to step there but he definitely got one hell of a view i read his book when i was about eight years old actually flying to the moon it was really good uh, he had a very prolific career. He was even um, sort of still promoting uh, space uh, well into uh, his old age. And he was still updating his um, uh, Facebook account just a few days ago. Um, but cancer uh, caught up with him and he's, he's left us now. That's really sad, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, th there will be new adventurers. Uh, there's new spacecraft. Uh, Starship is uh, due to have a, a, a Starship 15 is due to have a launch uh, in the next uh, few days. So that's perhaps the next generation. And it having been picked as the uh, vehicle that will take people to the moon, or so will land people in the moon. Um, it might not be so far. It's 50 years since uh, people uh, walked on the moon. Perhaps it's not going to be another 10 years, perhaps, um, before someone else, uh, man and woman, walks on the moon again. It's a shame that the original Apollo guys are probably not going to see it. Well, the one that's left, you know, given the time frames. You know, hopefully he will, but I really hope he does. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you very much. That, that brings us the formal end of our evening tonight. 
Um, you can hang around if you'd like to have a, a, a quick chat. I'll stay on until everyone's left. Um, if, in case anyone wants to have a catch up, find out what they perhaps can get involved in. Uh, if they, they've got loads of cash and they want to spend and don't know how to spend it, uh, you can always have a chat to uh, members of the committee. But thank you again, Mary. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. And uh, are you going to uh, be on uh, Reach Out and Touch Space tomorrow? Hopefully, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Chris, I've got your message. I'm just replying privately. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, so good night, everyone. Um, for those who want to hang on, uh, please feel free. Um, but I uh, hope to see you in May. Thank you.